part of what is happening today uh, is uh, getting small businesses up and running by giving them access to capital that they need to maintain their payrolls. Uh, we want to make sure that these small businesses are not going to have to shut down, and uh, more importantly, they're not going to have to eliminate payrolls for their employees simply because business is required to either be closed or uh, drastically limited as a result of our efforts to prevent the spread of the coronavirus in the state of Texas. What this capital will do will provide these companies the resources they need to keep employees on the payroll for the remaining few weeks or so until businesses can begin that process of opening back up. And so I'm, I'm very proud of Goldman Sachs, of the Lyft Fund, of all these entrepreneurs that we had on this call right here uh, to make sure that they continue to stimulate the Texas economy. That said, I cannot emphasize enough. Our primary goal in the state of Texas right now is to ensure we're doing everything we can to reduce the spread of the coronavirus, uh, contain it, uh, make sure that uh, the state is a safe place uh, for all Texans. And along those lines, uh, lines I have uh, some good news. I, I will call it glimmers of hope with a whole bunch of red flags attached to those glimmers of hope. Uh, the glimmers come from what the numbers are beginning to show. Uh, the numbers are these, and that is, uh, as of earlier today, uh, there have now been uh, more than 133,000 Texans who have been tested for COVID-19. Of that number, 13,827 tested positive. Uh, currently, there are 1,176 Texans who are hospitalized because of COVID-19. Uh, there are now... Uh, a high watermark number of 286 Texans who have lost their lives because of COVID-19. Uh, very importantly, there are 2,269 Texans who had tested positive for COVID-19 but who are now categorized as recovered. So those are the numbers. Let me present to you the context. The context is this, and that is, first, if you look at uh, the numbers provided across the entire country, meaning the numbers for the entire United States of America, their numbers show uh, that what, what came out late yesterday uh, was the lowest number of people who tested positive in America in a week, showing that uh, the curve in the United States of America truly is beginning to flatten. Similarly, in Texas, uh, the number of people who tested positive as of the close of business yesterday was the lowest in an entire week and the second lowest since late March. Now, those are good numbers, but let me get into the red flags. Uh, one thing that I have seen is it, it seems as though uh, every Sunday uh, is the lowest day in the week for the number of people who test positive. I don't know if it's because testing occurs less on a Sunday or if the reports come in less on a Sunday. Uh, but so Sunday, yesterday, was lower in the number of people testing positive. However, it still sets a good trend in, in that it was the second lowest number of people who tested positive since late March. If those trends continue, it truly will mean that Texas is moving in the right direction of flattening the curve and lowering uh, the number of people who will be testing positive. I highly caution you, however, it's too early to decisively make that call. Similarly, with regard to hospitalizations, the number I mentioned about 1,176 people being hospitalized because of COVID-19, that also is the lowest number of people hospitalized in a week. So it shows that our hospitalizations are declining. The same is true with regard to deaths. Even though Tragically, we lost more Texans because of COVID-19. The good news coming from that would be this, and that is the, the number of deaths reported yesterday was a three-day low in Texas in the number of deaths. Similarly, if, if you look at the growth trend line of cumulative cases uh, that have been reported in the state of Texas, over the past three days, that cumulative case trend line has decreased in what's called the, the percentage rate of increase. Uh, as of Friday, 
the percentage rate of increase was 12 percent. Uh, over the weekend, it was 11 percent. As of this morning, that trend line is showing a 10 percent in the growth of cumulative cases. Those are exactly the kinds of numbers that we need to see if we're going to show that we are bending the curve of COVID-19 in the state of Texas. And once again, I'm very, very proud of the fact uh, that as it concerns recoveries, uh, Texas ranks second highest in the United States in the number of recoveries uh, reported. We continue to see very good news with regard to our ability to provide even more PPE to facilities across the entire state of Texas. This past week, uh, more than 4,459,000 masks uh, have been shipped. Um, almost 175,000 face shields have been shipped. Uh, more than 2,575,000 gloves have been shipped. And more than 11,000 gowns have been shipped. So those are numbers showing that our ability to deliver PPE continues to increase. And again, uh, considering what uh, we believe is our incoming supply chain, those numbers should continue to improve going forward. Another issue that is asked about by so many Texans, so many Texans have lost jobs uh, because of the impact of the coronavirus. Because of those who have lost jobs, there's been a record number of Texans who have applied for unemployment benefits. The good news is with uh, the additional hours uh, working seven days a week, the Workforce Commission has processed even more claims. My recollection when I last spoke to the public about this on Friday uh, was about uh, a number less than 400,000 claims have been processed. As of today, there are now 1,138,000 claims that have been paid. The total amount paid out now amounts to well over $400 million. I know that there's still Texans who have not yet received uh, their unemployment benefits, but with the increased amount of resources that the Workforce Commission is providing to this process and with the results that we are seeing, we are expecting uh, a heightened ability uh, to very quickly be able to process the remaining unemployment claims and get Texans the unemployment benefits they deserve. With that said, I'm going to open it up for, uh, for Dr. Hellerstedt. Say it again, questions? Okay, for, for questions at this time. I know you said that this will be coming later on, but can you give any indication of as for a timeline for reopening the economy? Sure. So what, what we're going to be doing later on this week is uh, we're going to be introducing Texas uh, to this comprehensive team that we have put together uh, that will very uh, comprehensively, carefully, strategically evaluate uh, what must be done for Texas to open back up, uh, ensuring that what we are doing is consistent uh, with data, uh, with uh, medical uh, analysis, uh, as well as strategies about which type of businesses will be able to open up. This is not going to be a uh, rush the gates, everybody uh, is able to suddenly reopen all at once. We have to understand that we must reopen in a way in which we are able to stimulate the economy while at the very same time ensuring that we contain the spread of COVID-19. And to that, uh, you know, Dr. Fauci's talked about a staged reentry, but he says you need to have the testing capacity to identify and then isolate people who are positive. Do you have that capacity at this point? And and how, you know, what's your optimism about being able to manage that? So importantly, because uh, of, of the medical advice that we will be getting uh, for uh, the team that will be involved in the slow process of reopening Texas back up for business. Uh, we will ensure uh, that a component of that will include adequate testing. Right before I came in here today, uh, I was on an hour-long conference call uh, with the Vice President, uh, with Dr. Burks, uh, going over uh, the very issue that you were talking about, and that is the strategic and necessary testing uh, that's needed in, in order for us to safely reopen the state for doing business. And they were talking about uh, the amount of testing supplies and testing strategies uh, that would be best to use for that process. 
And those will be issues that we will go over in, in more detail later on this week. Are you, you know, the, the president tweeted yesterday, uh, governors, get your state's testing programs and apparatus perfected. Be ready. Big things are happening. No excuses. How much are you being guided by what's coming from the White House in terms of your own timetable, or is that really your own discretion? This is all done in collaboration. We maintain constant contact uh, with the White House. So you'll know over the weekend, uh, I spoke with both the president and the vice president uh, about these and other strategies. And so uh, this is something where uh, there's not something unusual or uh, new to governors coming from the White House. Uh, this is something where uh, the White House and the White House team uh, has been communicating with governors for weeks now. And so they've been preparing us for uh, what to expect, what to anticipate, and talking about the way in which we will all be working in collaboration to ensure that we will be able to slowly, strategically, smartly, and safely uh, begin to open up uh, the expansion of economic development in the United States. But was the President offering you counsel, or was he asking your advice about how to proceed? Well, it's, it's both. Uh, so th this is a two-way street. Uh, but the, both the president, the vice president, uh, the doctors who advise them uh, were talking about certain strategies that would be most effective. But they always ask questions. They always want to know uh, what the governors think are, are best. And they understand this, uh, and that is the states are so varied in the United States. What, what may work for Nebraska may be different than works for New York, et cetera. And so I think that there will be a level of flexibility for states and maybe even within a state about what type of strategy will work best, knowing that even within the state of Texas, there are certain areas that are harder to hit by the coronavirus still right now than there are others. And so these are all issues that we will continue to work out uh, in the coming days before the announcement is made, but also even once the announcement is made. Now, we will need to maintain flexibility based upon uh, the data showing the level of containment of COVID-19. Again, uh, how will you enforce, I know that we don't know all the details yet, but just in terms of if there is, you know, we haven't seen our peak yet, and if we get to a point where it gets worse again, and just trying to maintain the level of social distancing, even with some of these uh, businesses opening back up and the concerns there that people may just start going out and not social distancing themselves from others. So we, we will be going over all of that as, as we roll out our plan. But again, because our ability to open business in the state of Texas will be tied to our ability to continue to contain the spread of COVID-19, for one, only businesses uh, that will have a minimum of zero impact on the spread of COVID-19 will be the first ones to be able to open up. Uh, and then secondarily, others will be able to open up based upon certain strategies that will be contained in my executive order. There are multiple reasons why an executive order will be used to begin this process, and, and that is uh, to ensure that it has the effect of law you know, so that only those that can open up uh, are allowed by the executive order, basically by a rule of law. But we want to continue that process and continue to be able to expand those that are able to open as we continue to show we are, are capable of containing the spread of the coronavirus in Texas. Can I ask about sure. schools real quick sure. and just um, the idea of whether or not there will be any further guidance given on that in, in a timely manner as districts are trying to figure out if they're going to open back up at all before the end of the year and where things stand there? Sure. You should expect an announcement on that this week. No. I, I, in a case that's now probably headed to the Supreme Court, and I don't know if you've had a chance to uh, offer your judgment on it, but Attorney General Paxson has interpreted your ban on uh, non-essential surgery to include abortions, except in the case where the life, of the life or health of the mother is at risk. Do you think that was a sound interpretation, or did it go too far? Uh, first, I haven't had a chance to keep up with what may be going on at the United States Supreme Court. The last I saw is it, it seems like the Fifth Circuit uh, agreed with the decision that I made. Do you think the, the, the judgment that that it includes abortion, even though that doesn't necessarily involve hospitalization or the use of the kind of equipment you're trying to conserve, it, does that make sense to you? So first, I mean, there's two ways you can view whether or not it was sound. One is whether or not it was legally sound, and according to the Fifth Circuit, it was legally sound. Uh, the second is whether or not it was medically sound. 
Uh, and that would be up to doctors. 